Hello everyone and welcome to our session today entitled Navigating Your Security Trust Journey with Microsoft. To interact in this session, you can type any messages or questions in the chat window in the lower right hand corner of your screen and your questions will be addressed in the Q&A portion of our session today. If we're unable to address your question, we will contact you post event. For closed captioning, please click the button in the lower right hand corner of your screen that shows CC. The session is being recorded and the recording will be available post event. At the end of the session, we will be sharing a brief survey. To complete this survey, we would appreciate you doing that before the end of the session. If you are unable to complete the survey before the end of the session, we will share that link with you via email and you'll have 24 hours to complete that survey. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Sloan Mankus. Sloan is my, the Microsoft Alliance Leader at PwC for Cyber and Risk. Sloan, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Akari, and welcome everyone. We are very excited today, both PwC and Microsoft, to be discussing with you navigating your zero trust journey uh, your security journey with Microsoft. And we are very excited. We know this is a very hot topic for many of you. It's on top of mind. And we know that the zero trust principles play into many of the decisions that you're making today. So uh, without further ado, let me just say uh, we are going to be taking questions and answering using the Q&A function in the uh, live we will reserve time at the end to answer any questions that do come in or uh, tee them up, but most likely answer them at the end. So we welcome questions. Please post them in the Q&A and we will moderate those. Without further ado, let me also uh, hand it over to our fantastic panel of speakers to introduce themselves. Lavanya, would you like to start out? So let me hand it over to Lavanya Murti. Thank you, Sloan. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lavani Murthy. I'm a cloud solutions architect at Microsoft. Uh, I'm focused on helping our clients and partners protect and respond to advanced threats with comprehensive best of the breed and integrated Microsoft solutions, uh, security solutions stack. Uh, over to you, Brian. Thanks. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the webinar today. My name is Brian Plourd. I'm a managing director in our cybersecurity consulting practice here at PwC. And I lead our network security solutions team, which means the last couple of years specifically have been living, breathing, sleeping zero trust. So specifically helping our clients uh, understand what zero trust means to them, helping them assess their current state of zero trust maturity, helping them identify gaps in their program and, and ultimately defining future state solutions to, to address those gaps. We also help with road mapping, implementation and support operations, et cetera. So with me today is a colleague of mine from PwC named Shai Lej. Uh, as well as Lavanya, who you've already met. So Shailesh, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? You're on mute, Shailesh. Sorry. Uh, hi, this is Shailesh Jiskande. I'm a director based out in uh, Atlanta. Uh, I'm part of the PwC US cybersecurity practice. Uh, I have overall 20 years of experience with pretty much core focus and network security segmentation, cloud security, and zero trust related technologies. Uh, recently, I've been uh, helping and advising my client in the security modernization uh, using you know, zero trust as the guiding framework um, in order to drive their uh, digital transformation journeys in a secured manner. So yeah. Awesome. So Katie, go ahead and move forward to the next slide. So let's get started. So what are we here to talk about today? We, we want to hit on a few different things, but really the first half of the conversation is going to be focused on level setting what zero trust really means and, and why it's important to you. Uh, in my experience working with clients, even the term zero trust can be confusing. There's a lot of ways to interpret the word zero trust, zero trust architecture, et cetera. So we want to spend some time helping navigate those waters, break it down a little bit further, and we'll be using the Microsoft model as a reference. The second half of the conversation is going to be focused on what do you do about it, right? Many of my clients understand the core principles of zero trust, but we want to spend a few minutes talking about what a zero trust journey looks like, how you can use a maturity model to plan and implement your own zero trust solutions using Microsoft technology. And then lastly, we'll wrap up with some Q&A as Sloan mentioned. So Shailaj, I'll hand it over to you to get started. Yeah, thank you, Brian. 
Um, so before we uh, kind of get into the definitions and what is zero trust, you know, just want to kind of set the ground and uh, what, why do we need to change this approach to the traditional security controls? So if you go to the next slide, basically, you know, uh, today we know, right, the uh, digital transformation is the new normal, right? We have seen organizations at, uh, even before the pandemic, right? Uh, digital transformation was pretty much number one on the CEO's list, right? Um, and for example, the consumer buying preferences were changing. For example, Amazon's and um, you know uh, uh, Uber's and Airbnb, right? So it was completely changing the preferences in uh, uh, using these internet connected uh, technologies. So what is really happening uh, with this is you know uh, the the whole journey the, with the with the uh, transformation coming into play. It has bought uh, uh, consumer preferences were changed and uh, uh, it has bought a uh, cloud tech technology. So the cloud has been a core foundational pillar for digital transformation. So it has bought uh, multiple technologies with the uh, uh, consumer preferences and that has really uh, changed the way how we look at security. Um, so what has really happened is uh, it has also bought the attack vectors. Uh, you know, the attacks were always happening, but with these new technologies coming in, security was, you know, very much at the forefront of it, right? And it put dual pressure with the changing platforms and technologies. It put dual pressure on the security team, which was always never thought of as these technologies were introduced. And, you know, of how do we modernize those security architectures, right? With the pandemic came coming in, we were looking at, you know, diverse workforce. Those workforce were work from home home, books or coffee shops. Uh, they were using a different set of tools like laptops, non-managed devices. They were bringing their own devices uh, to access the corporate applications. So it was completely uh, changing the way we work and those risks were evolving. And that's why a, an approach to change a city was much needed. And that's what I would say uh, zero trust architecture. It's kind of the transformational thing which is required to address this today's reality. So uh, having said that, if you go to the next slide. Um, so uh, with these transformations uh, and new technologies coming in, the threats have been evolving, right? So we have always seen uh, multiple of these threats are coming in the past, but the number of these incidents have increased drastically in the last few years. For example, the third party compromise, right? We've seen it one of the biggest retail chains, their credentials and credential theft, 80% of the thefts, you know, are through uh, stolen credentials. So we see, you know, bypassing the perimeter defenses and then using your backend, uh, you know, IoT or edge devices to gain access to the uh, critical systems. So that that is one of the uh, threat attack vectors. Social engineering, again, you know, an email coming in. So it again bypasses your perimeter defenses. Um, uh, email which considers to be legit uh, gets into your inbox and you click in and then an outbound initiation and then, you know, the attacker can take uh, control of the systems. So as the uh, uh, ransomware we have seen recently, uh, the gas, um, uh, uh, threat what we have seen, which has impacted a lot of uh, customers. Again, you know, lack of segmentation, the malware propagates from one systems to another systems and it breaches the trust which is there into your internal systems. As we move on, you know, cloud data exposures, we have seen, uh, you know, multiple of those attacks as organizations move from on-premise systems to the cloud, assuming the security uh, cloud is much safer place to host data. That's not the case, right? If you do not have the right set of controls, which you have on-prem in the cloud, your data is exposed. And we have seen multiple examples of that. Uh, same goes with lateral movement and insider threats as well, uh, you know, with the lateral Moment, you know, one system getting compromised, it can laterally because of the flat network, uh, you know, system uh, attacks moves from one system to another, and that's how the breaches happen. So one common element in all these evolving threats uh, is basically uh, anchored on traditional perimeter based security strategies where we assume that the perimeter is that boundary. Everything inside the perimeter is trusted. And you know, if you are coming in from outside, you are you are not trusted. I think that is the main uh, challenge which we need to change as we look into evolving uh, our our zero trust architectures. So uh, you know, if we go to the next slide, we'll we'll talk about the definitions and how does really zero 
Trust, Microsoft Zero Trust architecture help you address these uh, common threat attack vectors. So uh, if you go to uh, the definition, what is Zero Trust? And we've been hearing this from multiple vendors. Everyone has a definition. It's, it's as confusing as what it was for cloud transformation and digital transformation really see uh, before we get into the definition what it is not a zero trust right for example it is not one single vendor it is not one single product it is not one single framework uh, it's not a single technology it is not about modernization of your vpn um, it is not about just deploying next generation firewall so what is really zero trust right so uh, the way I look at Zero Trust, it's basically three things. One is it's an integrated security platform which uses contextual signals uh, across your entire digital footprint, right? So it uses contextual signals from your users, device, infrastructure, network services, and it uses the data to create dynamic set of policies, right? And that's very critical. So you have, um, it's integrated because it has to work across the entire digital footprint and across different security platforms it uses contextual data when i say contextual data I means who the user is what device is trying to access from which country is trying to come in based on that it creates some kind of uh, risk scoring and based on that it create dynamic policies and dynamic policy is extremely important because you can step up your application based on the user identity and and from which devices it comes in so again uh, the premise here is that you know we we need to move from uh, to zero trust across the entire digital footprint. We need to move from a static network based parameter to pretty much towards the user assets and where they are trying to access those resources. That's why they say Gartner is coined the word that identity is the new parameter. You know, the users have been accessing all these services from pretty much any location using any device. So those security controls need to be very much closer to the uh, to the users and the devices what they are accessing from. Um, and again, as, as we get into the zero trust architecture, we need to assume there is no implicit trust grant these users into the network doesn't mean that you have pretty much broad access. Yeah. So, so I'm going to jump in. Can you turn your video off? Your audio seems to be really um, delayed and garbled. So I'm thinking maybe if you turn your video off, it might help. OK, sorry. Uh, I, I'll speak and hopefully it's get better. <clears throat> so um, so yeah, so I think uh, with, with the definition which I just kind of you know explained, uh, there are three real principles we are talking here, right? In order to build that zero trust architecture. One is uh, verify explicitly. What that really means is every transactions and that transactions could be between two machines, between two users, uh, you know, and trying to access your application data needs to be authenticated and authorized in a map and it needs to be encrypted as well. And it needs to happen on a continuous basis uh, so that, you know, every each of these transactions can sorry. Each of these transactions can get authenticated and authorized in a seamless manner. Use least uh, privilege access. That means you know just in time and just enough access to those uh, transactions. Uh, again, it's been there for a long time, but you know that least privilege access grants you access to the applications and not the entire network footprint, right? Because we have seen in the past, just because you are on the, just because you have access to an application, you have a much broader access to the network. So we move from a network-based access to an application-based access. That's where the least privilege access comes into play, okay? where you are only allowing to the data and applications based on who you are, right? And then the assume bridge. This is an extremely important principle. What that really means is if you assume that uh, there is a thread within your enterprise, that means you will start to segment your workload and protect your critical workload uh, and compartmentalize that data. So that really helps you to define your segmentation and strategy in order to reduce that lateral movement and propagation of threads within the networks. So those are the three core uh, principles which uh, sets the foundation for the zero trust architecture. Now that we have seen those three principles, uh, you know there are six 
core pillars against which you apply these principles, right? The first being uh, the identity. And again, this is across zero trust is just not about network or about users. It's about pretty much everything. That's why it's pretty much integrated across the whole ecosystem. The first one being identity, right? Do you got to make sure that your identities, your users, you know, uh, you you have you could have multiple uh, identity platforms in your organization, how you can consolidate those and try and start using the cloud based identity programs where you leverage multi factor authentication where you can leverage single sign on uh, and all those capabilities which then allow you to get rid of the credential thefts, right? That's why having a single source of truth, be in the cloud, be in the on-prem and having a good solid single source of truth is extremely important for, for the whole zero trust uh, architecture. The second one being the devices, the devices which we generally use to access the applications and data which resides in your data center, right? So as you use those devices, how can we make sure that those devices are managed uh, and they have the right set of checks and balances before granting them access to the network, right? So you do kind of a posture assessment, make sure that it has the right set of patches, everything is in place, uh, it has a certificate installed, you know, all those things are in place before you kind of allow access for that particular device to your corporate resources. Um, and then you get into the applications. The applications is the business logic through which you access your data. Again, the same uh, principle follows in terms of, you know, making sure that application have enough, uh, you need to know what uh, these applications should have access to. So, you know, the right level of access, you know, apply the least privileged control if the application doesn't need to have an access to a critical database, make sure that is confined and all those principles are applied to the applications. Infrastructure is basically what you host your applications on. So it could be a serverless infrastructure, it could be a containers, it could be a virtual machines, it could be a physical servers. Uh, you know, how do you assert least privileges on this infrastructure? How they have right set of patches? How do you make sure that, you know, there are uh, uh, those systems do not have any vulnerabilities, use the latest versions of operating system and so on and so forth. Um, Networking is again a critical element. It is the it is the mechanism through which you connect different systems and applications. How do you employ network segmentation so that lateral movement is blocked? So that's a very critical element within the network space. How do you uh, uh, you know reduce the reliance on VPN because you know VPN allows you to have a much more broader access. So those are the things we look into the networking uh, and how do you encrypt data as data moves within your network. So those are some of the controls you apply on the networking and pretty much the last and the most important one is the data because everything is data driven. So how do you make sure that you classify, label and protect data and have end to end encryption uh, and have the right levels of guardrails defined for your core and critical uh, data assets. So those are some of the key principles and the pillars uh, which uh, which uh, in your zero trust journey and there are technologies Microsoft have technologies in each of these pillars in, in terms of how do you can apply those uh, security principles. So to move on and now from here I think uh, more to the uh, security zero trust security architecture. My colleague um, uh, Lavanya she will explain the zero trust architecture end to end zero trust architecture. If you move on to the next slide. Thank you, Pavik. So uh, we've heard about all of the six pillars that you need to implement controls for that holistic zero trust approach uh, and extend it through your entire digital estate. And applying these zero trust uh, controls across the foundation, right? Let's um, take a brief look at um, of them. Uh, so as uh, we discussed, right, identity, which is the new control plane uh, in the modern security world, knowing really who's requesting access is essential and identity must be validated explicitly, not inferred from your environment and ensure that you know you're secure at the point of the access by bringing in users into a common identity system using strong authentication and threat intelligence to validate that authentication. So verify explicitly, right? The zero trust principle, that's what you're doing with the identities. 
And then moving on to devices, again, verify the devices. All data access request results in the transfer of that data to a browser or an application on that device. Knowing that state of the device is really critical in the world where you know devices are BYOD, it could be infected, lost or stolen where you do not have complete control on those devices. Um, so ensuring that you have mobile device management and mobile application management are critical to protect the data once it has been accessed on that device. So once you do those two pillars, then let's talk about data. Wherever possible, that data should be protected from unauthorized transfer by automated classification and encryption. And this protects against intentional and accidental misrouting of the downloaded data, and it's from both bad actors external and your insider uh, 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 users as well to protect from insider risks. And then hardening applications. So application access and configuration must be secured to mitigate the intrinsic application risks and ensure that it is governed by the policy. Uh, application behavior, including shadow IT, uh, should be understood to and monitored to protect from those anomalies. And then protecting from the infrastructure, regardless of where it is hosted, where uh, what type of workload it is, whether it is hosted in hybrid or multi cloud, or it's a IaaS workload or a PaaS workload, ensure you're really utilizing the cloud fabric according to the best security principles and utilize that intelligence. Um, to uh, pr provide the protection and then govern networks, mitigate those lateral movements by using adaptive segmentation uh, of the workloads and monitor and protect from the anomalous traffic patterns. So once you implement these controls across these six pillars, how do you tie it all together? The key is really tying together. That's where the Microsoft's value proposition comes is that key integrated policy driven access. So in addition to that micro segmentation, it means more than networks, right? That micro segmentation is at the device level, at the user level, and also requires you gate access based on the low uh, role of the user, the location of the user, the behavior patterns, the data sensitivity, the client application that it is being accessed. All of these are uh, crucial to implement that zero trust across each of these pillars and tying it together in that policy driven access, which is automatically enforced at the time of the access and continuously throughout the session, right? It's not you've validated at the beginning and then you're done, but you know, it's that continuous access evaluation for changes in the uh, access if it needs to be protected against. And then automated threat and detection and response. So telemetry from these systems above uh, must also be processed and acted automatically. So attacks happen very rapidly and your defense systems must act at uh, that rapidly as well, right? And humans just can't react that fast enough. So you really require integrated intelligence and policy based response for that real time protection. And then finally, visibility and analytics and automation, um, because this, cre uh, this key integrated intelligence, which is policy driven and real time, needs that automated threat protection so you can combat threats in real time. And because we really believe that organizations should embrace zero trust to protect against advanced threats, we've implemented the zero trust principles into each and every uh, service and product that we've built. Our integrated solutions offer that built in zero control uh, trust control so you can implement security at a scale for the in across your entire digital estate, regardless of you know uh, whether it's hosted in hybrid multi cloud or uh, regardless of what workload type it is. Um, over to you, Brian. Awesome, thank you. So now let's transition into talking about how you implement zero trust. So this first half of the conversation was kind of level setting expectations. Now we'll talk a bit more tactical in detail. So really zero trust should be thought of as a journey, right? There's no silver bullet. There's no single technology solution that will get you there. Charlotte, you already mentioned that. You, you can't buy a commercial off the shelf product today at least and slap it in and all of a sudden your zero trust it doesn't exist. So you need to think of it as a journey that builds with increased capability over time as you grow in maturity. So the first step in that journey is to define and understand the components that you're dealing with, right? We use the term ecosystem. You'll hear me use that term a lot. Um, it, the Microsoft model uses six architectural domains to represent that ecosystem. It, the 800-207 guidance from NIST, if you've read it, it, doesn't do a great job talking about zero trust as an ecosystem. It's very focused on the access proxy model, which is your 
subject accessing a resource through a policy decision and enforcement point. There's a lot more to zero trust than just that, and th you need to consider other components that work together to make all of this happen. Now, in terms of achieving zero trust, you're, you're going to do it through making measured advancements in each of those architectural domains. One thing to think about as you, as you think through your organization's maturity towards zero trust is that it, it needs to be holistic, right? Becoming mature doesn't mean that you become very mature in just one area. You, you need to define appropriate maturity targets for each area, um, which ultimately should be defined and driven by your overall security strategy, right? It's not just to say that, that all six of these areas in the Microsoft model need to advance at the same time, right? You, you can move up in maturity slowly across each of the areas, but you don't have to. It might make sense for you to dive deep into one area that's important and relevant to you uh, and focus on other areas down the line. You need to remember this is about continuous improvement. This is going to take a long time. This is not going to be a big bang, quick win approach. I'll talk about the maturity assessment a little bit later, but really part of the journey will be understanding where you are today, setting those realistic and achievable targets for where you want to be in the future, and then highlighting areas um, that might fall below that target mark for each of those areas, right? Un understanding the gaps you have in your environment today so you can understand what you need to do to address them going forward. Once that's done, you can build actionable roadmaps to, to really help move forward towards zero trust, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Okay, if you want to jump to the next slide. So what we have on this slide is the, the Microsoft zero trust maturity model, and you'll see the three levels here of getting started, advanced, and optimal. Uh, there's a few maturity benchmarks from, from the model that are listed here. They're all publicly available on the website, which we linked down below as well. But really, there's the six architectural pillars and there's specific technology capabilities that you should have in place at each level to be considered you know, mature in that area. What I'll say here is that there are a number of different maturity models out there, right? PwC has one. This is the Microsoft model. You've probably seen others from Forrester and CISA. Um, while not all of the models are perfectly aligned, they all do a great job of, I think, differentiating capabilities at each maturity level. And they're all mostly covering the same architectural buckets, right? Identity, endpoint, network, arc applications, data, those are kind of the main five areas that each model hits on. It, it really doesn't matter which model you pick, right? I think Microsoft has a great model. You, you can pick all of them. It, it, what really matters is that you're able to assess your current state against leading industry practices, right? You, you need to be able to measure where you are today so you can define the targets for where you want to be tomorrow. One other comment I'll make here is that you really should feel free to customize the model to your own needs, right? I'd say keep it simple is, is my advice when I talk to clients. Most of these maturity models are, you know, comprehensive and I use air quotes when I say that. And, and what I mean is that they're just bloated in some cases. There's a, a lot of material in these maturity models. And, and there's a fine line to me between um, what capability should be considered zero trust versus what's just good security hygiene, right? Like there are maturity models out there and certain aspects of them might not um, be ready from a zero trust perspective. A good example is the White House memo that some of you may have written, re uh, read recently that was defining requirements to achieve zero trust for federal agencies. Um, some really good stuff in there. It's, it's about how to take zero trust and make it actionable. The problem is Certain aspects of that I don't necessarily agree with as being certain tr zero trust, right? So one of them is that um, you have to have a vulnerability disclosure program for any public facing websites, right? I, I love that. That's a great security requirement, but it really doesn't have anything to do with maturing towards zero trust. So really what I try, try and say here is um, in order to make this actionable, you should think through what's important to you, slim down the maturity models as needed to keep it simple and, and make it more realistic. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide, Katie. I guess in that case, sorry, it's Bobby. Uh, so what I want to share on these next two slides that are coming up is, is actually how to move forward with zero trust using the Microsoft methodology. So one more slide, Bobic. So the first slide I'll share here is it's our methodology on how we implement zero trust at our clients. Pretty much every one of our clients at this point is a Microsoft customer, right? In some form or fashion, some are you know all in on Azure and those services, and others might just be using you know Active Directory internally for authentication, right? So it, regardless, it makes sense to think through where Microsoft and Microsoft technology will fit within your own zero trust journey, whether or not you're all in on the Azure stack or whether you're just using individual components. But when a client comes to us and says, you know, we want help implementing zero trust using Microsoft technology, the, the way we break it down from an implementation perspective is, is to these three buckets. The first step is to build a secure foundation. What we mean is 
in order to enable zero trust policies, you have to have specific technologies in place to provide context. Those rich signals from the endpoints, from the users in order to make decisions. You, you can't do it without it, right? So in the Microsoft world, it's, it's managing your identities, it's managing your devices, and it's managing those endpoints. So before we can enable zero trust policies, we have to make sure that some of those foundational tools are in place, right? These are things like Azure Active Directory, Azure MFA, Intune, Defender, et cetera. Simply put, you can't do context-based access control until you can collect context or telemetry from the user or the device. Okay, so once that's in place, that might be a multi-month, multi-year effort, depending on how far you want to go to deploy those technologies. Uh, once the foundation has been built, we can talk about using the technology and interpreting signals from that technology in order to control access to applications and resources. The way we do that in this middle box here is using the conditional access engine along with some other applications that Microsoft has at their disposal. Uh, effectively help clients build their policies to interrogate the contextual user, user uh, information, the device information, the application information. Um, network location, where the user is coming from, as well as session risk, and then make the decision to either allow, deny, or restrict access, right? That, that's the traditional 800-207 access model, access proxy model. It's using uh, conditional access as the policy decision point and the policy enforcement point to control the access to the resources. So once you're able to collect the device signals, we interrogate them to make uh, decisions, you're effectively doing zero trust, right? Obviously, as you think about maturity and improving your program over time, you'll be layering on additional technologies, you'll be layering on ad additional signals and additional context to make decision. But really to us, the, the last step in kind of a holistic model is looking at the other components that need to be considered to further secure the resources specifically addressing threats associated with lateral movement, both east-west within the data center as well as north-south into the data center, um, within the cloud, between clouds, to on-prem access, et cetera. And, and the way we do that is through various network segmentation solutions um, using you know, native Azure tools like VNets, NSGs, Azure Firewall, but also using some of the Office 365 capabilities of uh, cloud app security, Azure WAF, Azure AD app proxy, et cetera. The, these technologies either operate as standalone security controls or they integrate with conditional access to help further restrict access to those applications based on both least privilege as well as the context that's defined. All right, next slide, Bobek. All right, so how do we get started, right? As, as I mentioned earlier, most of our clients still don't know where to start, right? They've sat through one or many of these presentations. They might have sat through some vendor demos, et cetera, and they're still maybe stuck. I use that term quite a bit when talking to the clients is what, what do we do next or what do we do first right the way we like to think about it is you should always start with a maturity assessment right you, you need to collect documentation you have to conduct interviews you have to get a good working baseline for what capabilities you have in place today what coverage the controls have that you do have in place and what your future state zero trust target might look like right and a good place to start again would be the microsoft zero trust maturity model that we talked about uh, and customize it to your own needs. So once you have your current state assessed, once you know what your maturity target will be or should be, then you can start identifying the gaps that need to be addressed, right? These are gonna likely be a combination of small gaps, uh, maybe just coverage gaps in certain areas, but also you might have some pretty massive capability gaps and that's totally okay, right? That's expected, so don't get intimidated. Uh, once those gaps are identified, then you should begin identifying solutions that can address your requirements and, and ultimately close those gaps that will help you define your future state zero trust architecture. Um, this will highlight the people, process, technology components that need to be in place to meet that maturity target from step one. And then lastly, you begin reviewing the gaps and tech solutions and, and start coming up with a plan to address them. Right? We think of this as the road mapping phase, right? scoping out you know, how much effort it will take, what the cost will be to close that gap bucketing different initiatives and grouping them uh, with like-minded initiatives, prioritizing them, right? My advice is always focus on some quick wins first, right? Structure the projects that you're working on with higher impact projects up front that have pretty low resource requirements. Um, don't focus on things that might be lower impact, but much higher effort, right? You need to remember zero trust is that journey that we talked about. It's all about continuous improvement over time as you deploy new capabilities and, and ultimately grow. Vanya, over to you to talk about the reference architecture. Uh, you're on mute still, Lavanya. 
Um, so we'll talk through Microsoft cybersecurity reference architecture. We'll look at various products and capabilities in here. So this architecture is available at akm.msmcra for you to look at in detail later on. It's a bit of an eye chart. So Microsoft takes a holistic integrated approach to the capabilities to really drive that simplicity and effectiveness, right? So first of everything is based off our uh, capabilities uh, that we collect uh, from the same underlying system that spans across every single product with 8 trillion signals per day um, uh, of context. And then we use agents or control points. Um, again, a single endpoint agent or a policy to control multiple different functions where possible, right? For example, if you look at our Defender for Cloud uh, apps, perform, it performs governance, it performs threat detection, it performs information protection all through a single agent. And to have that consistent experience where possible, right, you know, we provide that integrated consistent experience per role, per task, per outcome. Um, for example, again, if you look at our Microsoft Information Protection, or now it's called Microsoft Purview, um, it has a single label for data that can be used for security, for data retention um, across clouds and platforms and operating systems. So most organizations, right, they operate um, in a multi-platform of Windows and Linux servers in data centers and application containers and many different uh, applications that they need to protect. And they start their security with the core set of security capabilities at the network edge or egress points uh, to protect from the extranet and the intranet resources. Many organizations then take advantage of the built-in Windows features um, to protect that basic uh, security hygiene through Active Directory and through secure, uh, Active Directory account security at the identity level and the group policy using uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager Configuration Manager, Intune MDM and MAM uh, to provide that cross-platform unified endpoint management across, again, Windows, Linux, iOS, and Android devices. And then Windows 10 security to provide that extensive platform capabilities, hardware, um, security integrations, and uh, to protect against those ever evolving threats. So once these two were in place, right, organizations first started adopting soft SaaS solutions, and first app usually was a productivity suite like Office 365, and this created the need for to evolve that access control beyond the firewall, beyond um, you know the perimeter to secure those cloud identities, and this is where the identity has become that new control plane, and it's not only for users and um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but also for workload identities. So this could be be your applications, it could be your mobile devices, it could be your IoT devices. So Azure Active Directory not only provides single sign-on uh, to eliminate that password, but you know, give truly strong authentication with passwordless and Microsoft and multi-factor authentication capabilities. So you have uh, Hello for Business for biometric authentication, you have Authenticator app, you have FIDO2 uh, two keys, regardless of where your organization is in the journey to become that passwordless or on that strong authentication journey, you have multiple options. Then we layer that with our identity protection with leaked uh, credential protections, uh, which bring in behavioral analytics and threat intelligence um, to those identities. And then our Azure Privileged Identity Management, which reduces the risk by providing just-in-time access to privileged accounts using approval workflows. And then all of this identity solutions also need governance, right? To ensure that right people have really right access to the resources. And these identities not only span uh, your employees, right, your user accounts, but also partner and customer and citizen citizen accounts. Because no, gone are the days where you know you're you're just working within your organization. There are um, almost in every scenario you're collaborating externally with partners, and you know your consumers uh, are increasingly, as mentioned at the beginning, right, want different experiences. So you have our Azure uh, B2B uh, and B2C capabilities to provide this. All of this is layered with our conditional access, which applies those three zero trust principles we talked about earlier, right? You know, verify explicitly, least privileged access, and um, to ensure that your control decisions are explicitly validating those user endpoints and uh, users and endpoints that are requesting access to the resources. So this has become the de facto security perimeter now uh, because, you know, that it's 
it's no longer a network. It's just modern identity and endpoint uh, services. And then we don't leave behind uh, your uh, hybrid applications, right? We have Azure AD app proxy, which extends those modern access control approach to uh, on-premises resources, or if you're still leveraging VPN, um, right? You know, extends those capabilities to that access to ensure that you can apply through conditional access um, that least privilege access and validate that device trust, validate that identity. So now beyond the SaaS, as organizations started exploring, um, you know, other clouds, other solutions, IaaS and PaaS, and take advantage of uh, cloud workloads uh, while uh, also having on-premises footprint and this hybrid infrastructure that's spanning multiple clouds, um, right? We have our Azure Marketplace where we bring in not only our solutions, but uh, uh, solutions from popular vendors and customers that you might have existing relationship with that you could extend uh, uh, to controls to the on-premises world as well, leveraging those solutions. We also provide something called private link, which helps you to extend those um, uh, networks to from your on-premises to the past services and to used by the applications. So you're not only with that private link bringing in the current controls and practices to the cloud, um, but you know will also be able to leverage the other technologies to implement zero trust principles. Right, be evolve beyond your current control set, which was perimeter based, move that into um, with a private link and extend it to identity network application data. The six pillars that we have been talking about uh, during this presentation. So with multi-cloud and Azure security, right? You know, we've invested in a wide range of capabilities to protect that entire state. We realize that, you know, there are organizations that, you know, multi-cloud and hybrid is the new norm where, you know, you have in your environment at least one or two clouds um, in addition to your hybrid footprint. So there are controls built into Azure that extend um, to AWS, to your on-premises, to Google Cloud um, and other clouds using our Azure Arc platform uh, and then we have lighthouse to provide that cross tenant support for azure services you know often used by managed service providers or customers you know very large customers who have multiple tenants because of subsidiaries and uh, mergers and acquisitions you use lighthouse to have that single pane of glass for control and um, uh, main um, governance aspect of it so Microsoft Defender for Cloud, it, it is your single starting point for managing security and compliance in Azure across hybrid, multi-cloud, IaaS and PaaS workloads through Azure Arc. It provides you a secure score to really start again to understand where you are, right? You know, what is your security posture today? And then it helps you provide um, guidance, right? It prioritized guidance for you to address and improve your security posture. For example, um, you know, any VMs that are directly exposed to the internet, are are there any web application firewalls missing on your web uh, applications? Are there out of date patches and anti malware signatures? And then we also give you a compliance dashboard within that Defender for Cloud to ensure that you, you can monitor your compliance and regulatory status. Then we move to Azure Firewall, which is our network security service to provide that high uh, protection for highly sensitive and regulated environments through TLS inspection, um, URL filtering and web categories. And then we have a firewall manager to help you administer all that through again a single pane of um, policy to across multiple firewalls. And then our web application platform provides that centralized web application protection for web applications uh, from common exploits and vulnerabilities. And then on top of this, we have capabilities for DDoS protection mitigations, um, Azure Bastion for securing remote access, ransomware resistant backup archives in through our Azure backup and confidential computing capabilities to protect data while it is being proce processed and, uh, you know, I have, heavily used in regulated industries and healthcare industries. Then we have our um, threat monitoring for OT and IoT. Again, you know, um, the threats, the common threats that are evolving today are going beyond your regular in network attacks, right? You know, oftentimes these OT and IoT devices are being targeted as well. So we have our Defender cl uh, for Cloud to extend that XDR capabilities even to OT devices. And these XDR capabilities are designed to integrate with our SIEM solution or even a third-party SIEM to provide that deep, a deep visibility uh, into 
to uh, the asset types to provide you that enhanced detection and response capabilities. So Microsoft Defender for Cloud currently covers, you know, all of the infrastructures in Azure, right? You know, VMs, storage, databases, um, containers, Key Vault, and then Defender for IoT uh, will help you provide that uh, act control, extend that control to the SCADA and ICS uh, systems in the um, to provide protection on those devices. So all of these protections again need to uh, are there to help you or security operations team to really manage active attacks and then we've got a um, solutions here in XDR and SIEM. We've invested in both uh, platforms or both uh, frameworks um, solutions with our Sentinel, which is our cloud native SIEM, which provides a broad visibility across the entire estate, not only in Azure, but again extended to other clouds and hybrid environments into IoT, OT, and IT devices. Um, again, you know, you have that integrated with our best of the breed uh, solutions across those endpoints, emails, um, applications, Again, going back to those uh, uh, six pillars, right? We have our Defender for Endpoint, which is our advanced uh, XD EDR platform for web content uh, capabilities, web content filtering, um, uh, threat and vulnerability management, and data loss prevention. Um, and then we also ensure that all of these capabilities uh, not only have um, protection capabilities, but responding capabilities through automation uh, using our SOAR technologies. And and then these are behind the scenes backed by our ML technology and behavioral analysis of that user accounts through um, UEBA. Then on top of that, you know, we are threat exports, uh, our hunting service built into M365 Defender, which provides uh, monitoring and analysis to critical threats. Um, is provided across the platforms. We have our detection and response team DART, which related teams provide uh, professional services to help investigate in your environment or hunt for um, potential existing threats. And then we have our Microsoft partners on top of it who leverage our solutions to provide that expertise to you. And then we have our Defender for Cloud apps, which is our CASB solution to protect against that shadow IT, uh, to ensure you have governance and threat protection that extends to regardless where your data is being hosted in, the, in those SaaS applications. And again, all of these capabilities, the M365 Defender capabilities, um, integrate into our SIEM solution. So for that single pane of glass for your um, uh, SOC team to investigate. So these security capabilities not only end there because you know for that holistic security approach, uh, your software that you're developing for your line of business applications should also incorporate security. So we provide our security development lifecycle um, and our uh, cloud uh, operational security assurance framework for you to incorporate those frameworks into your applications that you're developing. And then we help uh, also uh, secure your applications with GitHub Advanced Security, which it provides dev DevSecOps and application development security uh, that integrates natively into your developer workflow. Again, regardless of what tools you use, it'll do the code scanning, uh, secret scanning, alerting, dependency review, and security policies across your LOB applications. For privileged access, which is often the target of your uh, of the attackers, we provide prescriptive guidance for securing those privileged access. Right, we uh, have capabilities like uh, privileged identity management, which which protects the accounts uh, by providing just in time access and just enough access. But also, we provide guidance around privileged access workstations. Right, how do you ensure you can apply those zero trust principles and leverage conditional access policies for secured workstation? access uh, for that privileged access. And then moving to our data pillar, right, you know, which is the mm, uh, driver of business, really protecting that data through our Microsoft purview solutions, which includes Microsoft information protection and Azure purview for that approach for discovering, classifying, protecting, again, regardless of um, whether that data is still hosted on premises, because we know that a lot of organizations still have repositories of NAS and SAS on premises and in the cloud. So you can protect, you could do govern of that data, you could discover that data, extend it to the compliance manager to ensure that you're complying with uh, regulations um, uh, that you're required to. 
So you have both secure score, which gives you a proactive security approach, um, posture improvement approach, and then a compliance score, again, a proactive approach to ensure that you are always compliant. And then all of these uh, it cannot be complete without a security program that also considers people security. So people security is really important as well, uh, in addition to the uh, technical controls that you've put in place. So we have a tax simulator to train your users to recognize these sophisticated phishing attacks, which are often the first point of entry into an organization. And we have insider risk management, which is to protect from inadvertent or malicious uh, attacks from within the organizations, because we've seen um, during during the past years uh, that you know the attacks are not only external threats but you know often insider threats have increased as well and then communications compliance to ensure that you're um, detecting capturing and acting on those inappropriate messages or uh, compliant behavior that you need to drive for example in financial industry um, that is all uh, possible again uh, with our communications compliance uh, solution so as you see, we, the solution is really, really comprehensive, right? It's, uh, it not only provides best in breed solutions, but our security solutions are often leaders in the analyst form quadrants and waves. So this diagram that I've shown uh, is not the complete security stack, right? We didn't uh, we didn't call out here the security policy advisor, the Windows secure server security features um, that are not on this diagrams. This is a lot of capabilities to plan for and understand, and we've developed guidance for you to run this um, uh, solutions and improve your zero trust in your environment through prescriptive guidance uh, and you know prioritization and initiatives what do you tackle first how do you rapidly modernize um, we have uh, tapped security best practices um, phased roadmap for you to implement this as you know brian mentioned zero trust is a journey it's not a silver bullet solution so we have patterns and frameworks with cloud adoption and well architected frameworks that your leverage and start that journey to implement um, the end-to-end -end zero trust security. With that, uh, you know, um, that concludes our presentation portion. We'll move to Q&A um, now. Bavik, do we have any questions? Hey, uh, thank you, Lavanya, Brian, and Shailaj. Uh, one of the questions is, what are some of the challenges that the clients face when they embark on the zero trust journey? Or maybe Brian, you can provide inputs from PwC perspective. Sure. Yeah. So I, there's a, a lot of challenges, and as I think, as I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges is just where to start, right? Where to begin. But from a technology perspective, maybe one of the biggest challenges I'm hearing is uh, as we think about device context or user context as kind of the primary one of the core tenets of zero trust. It, it's a lot of my clients are struggling with what is considered the right level of context to use, right? And and what to do when certain context might not be available, right? So things like is a device managed or is the user coming from, you know, a region that we do business in like the United States? It, those are really easy to get context on and then provide access restrictions around, but there's there's others that are a lot more difficult, right? Determining user behavior and what's considered normal, right? Determining whether a device is in quote unquote compliance, not just is it running an agent, but does it have the right policies and posture that my enterprise would expect to see? Um, is the device vulnerable, right? Integrating with a vulnerability management platform to determine whether or not the device is healthy enough to be on the network. Some of those things are a lot harder to do from a context perspective. So I, I think the answer we have on that aspect is again, remember it's a journey. We've said that several times. Don't focus on you know perfect, right? Don't let perfect get in the way of progress and focus on the ones that are easy, right? Focus on whether it's devices managed. Is there an MFA authentication prompt that you can provide? Is the user coming from a permitted region or, or a non blacklisted location? That, that's one area that I think most of my clients struggle with is just level setting. Um, you know what's considered good enough to start as opposed to what's ideal future state. Lavanya, on the Microsoft side, are there any specific areas that come to mind that a lot of clients are are considered challenges as they think about zero trust? 
zero trust is approached from a security aspect, but I think primarily, you know, which is what it is. But I think most organizations need to take a step back and really think about uh, as a you know digital transformation initiative or a cloud um, journey migration initiative. How you thought about going to cloud? How did you think about doing digital transformation in your organization? There was learning, there was adoption curve. It's the same strategy that you need to employ for zero trust. Take a step back and don't talk about technical controls at the beginning really understand what is it that you're trying to do from an organization standpoint and involve uh, all the same players that you would involve in a zero uh, in a, uh, a zero trust strategy as well that you have done with your digital transformation right you know there should be a leadership uh, that sets the guidance of security leadership roles and the architect roles you want governance you want to bring along your security engineers your application security engineers uh, right it's just not an IT project don't forget about your application um, and ensure that you know that security control extends to your DevSecOps and data security as well. Bring in your people security. Uh, oftentimes, people security is left where you have controls, but you know you haven't trained your users. It takes an entire organization to move to this new mindset of security where to combat uh, the sophisticated threats we are seeing. Right? It's security is and everybody's responsibilities in an, in an organization. Um, and then responding the, to those security threats should also be part of that. It's just not implementing the controls, but your security, how you do security and your SACAPs need to be modernized as well for the new world, um, as opposed to just the perimeter security controls, uh, you know, move along and recognize security at every layer. Kerry, back to you. Great, thank you so much everyone for joining our session today. And I have placed um, in the Q&A window announcement, you'll see that there is a survey that we'd love to have you complete if you can do that before you leave the session today. And if you're not able to do that, we will also be e emailing that to you. And as of that, this concludes our session for today.